sinuous or angular reverential or mythical recycled and repurposed or reproduced in the classical style whimsical or visionary garden ornamentation in all its many forms adds to the atmosphere and our experience of a garden in this video we not only explore different types of ornamentation but consider how they might be best incorporated into our own garden spaces let's start with one of the most impressive garden ornaments in england and one of the most important surviving 18th century chinese influenced buildings in europe today the Great Pagoda is an icon of the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew in London. It was completed in 1762 as a birthday tribute to Augusta, Dowager Princess of Wales, the mother of King George III. Designed by architect Sir William Chambers, following his visit to China, the 10 storeys reach 163 feet or 50 metres, with 253 steps up to the viewing gallery, a climb rewarded by spectacular views across London. Since the £5 million restoration of the Great Pagoda, with renovations completed in 2018, there have been some important additions. The 80 dragons that had adorned the roofs until their removal in 1784 are an impressive presence once again. The original dragons, made of hand-carved gilded wood, were rumoured to have been studded with precious gems and therefore sold to settle the Prince Regent's gambling debts. In reality, the pinewood was of unsuitable quality and simply became rotten after particularly bad winters. Nonetheless, the giant pagoda itself remains a masterpiece of design, building and carpentry, embodying an era when European imagination was gripped by Chinese art and culture, reflecting the increasing trade between the two countries. A Shinwazari pavilion was also built at Kew for Augusta the Dowager Princess, located on a small island in the centre of a menagerie which included many exotic birds, a peccary from South America, the Quaha Plain zebra that was later hunted to extinction, and by 1792 a large breeding group of kangaroos, the first ever seen in England and the only specimens in Europe at that time. In the domestic garden, a rather more modest form of pagoda can still add charm and interest. One of its design qualities, making it so appealing, is that it not only accentuates the vertical axis, drawing the eye upwards, but that its sequence of roofs help draw attention outward on a horizontal plane, and this integrates it very harmoniously and holistically within a space. A similar effect can be achieved with layered slates, where there is both vertical and layered horizontal interest. These replacement dragons are guarding a secret. The eight at ground level have been hand-carved from cedar wood, each weighing a quarter of a tonne. The other 72 were produced using a 3D printer, with hollow interiors to reduce weight and skillfully hand-painted for an authentic appearance. Those above ground level have their wings drawn back, making them more streamlined and resilient in forceful winds. Some 50 miles southeast of the Great Pagoda stand the ruins of Old Scotney Castle in Kent, 
reflected in the rather chilly looking waters of the moat, which along with the river, stream and ponds, supports 24 different species of dragonflies and damselflies, which emerge each spring and summer. This wildlife haven is celebrated in the ethereal fluidity of the dragonfly dancer, the wire form creating a dynamic appearance while echoing the twisted branching forms of the surrounding bare winter trees. Winter is a perfect time to appreciate the merits of garden sculpture and statues. The author John Woolridge, writing back in 1677, commented that the whole purpose of statues was to provide winter diversion to recompense for the loss of past pleasures and to buoy up hope of another spring. This was once the site of Henry Moore's three-piece reclining figure draped. With this beautiful work of art, the eye is drawn to the spatial relationship and light and shadow between the solid components of the sculpture. The surrounding garden is a backdrop to the piece. This contrasts with the more interactive element between the dragonfly dancer and the surrounding winter birches it seems to echo. This illustrates how the shape, solidity of form and texture of a sculpture affects the way our attention is either focused on qualities within the object itself or is more interactive with elements of the living features around it. It is also worth considering how changing seasons affect the mood and atmosphere of a garden and how our choice of statue or sculpture may enhance or play off the surrounding character of planting. For example, this striking sculpture at the Eden Project in Cornwall is both aesthetically arresting but also a sympathetic presence in the space, mirroring the architectural forms of the foliage and finding a balance between the statement of human design and the natural world. In the garden landscape, a well-placed statue draws attention along a vista and provides a focal point to rest the eye. Interest in the classical statues of antiquity was revived during the Italian Renaissance of the 15th and 16th centuries. Classical statues were regarded as symbols of power, harking back to the great civilizations of ancient Greece and the Roman Empire also representing an appreciation of knowledge and culture. These statues carry stories and mythology, evoking gods and goddesses, warriors, wise sages and healers, an unbridled realm of imagination, liberated from the cycles of nature to which the garden itself is bound. From the 17th to 19th centuries, Italy was a key destination for the grand tour of the European upper classes, and many statues, both authentic and reproduced, were transported back to Britain to adorn the gardens of the privileged as a demonstration of good taste, wealth and worldly perspective. The appeal of mythology invoked by classical statues endures today in both traditional and modern forms. The Rites of Dionysus at the Eden Project in Cornwall is a bacchanalian artwork installed amongst the grapevines in the Mediterranean biome. Here, Dionysus lives up to his legend as a divine communicant between the living and the dead, linking modern day visitors on the pilgrimage of tourism to the cult followers of over two and a half thousand years ago. The colourful sight of a peacock and the distinctive mournful sound of its cry is familiar to visitors of many stately homes across the UK. It has become an iconic form of living ornamentation in grand gardens. Peafowl originated in India and are believed to have been introduced into Britain by the Romans who were known to serve the meat as a delicacy. Writing in the 14th century, Geoffrey Chaucer coined the term peacock to describe an ostentatious person strutting about in their finery. Like peacocks, male pheasants are more colourful than the brown feathered females. With origins in Asia and Eastern Europe, these game birds have been in the UK since at least Norman times and possibly Roman. 
according to the Wildlife Trusts, they became locally extinct and almost forgotten until being reared by gamekeepers in a 19th century revival. There are both truly wild pheasants and release birds living in the countryside, and in ornamental gardens they may become semi-domesticated. Butterflies, bees and other insects bring lively living ornamentation to the garden, and by growing as many pollinator-friendly plants as possible, we can ensure these precious mobile jewels come to adorn our flowers and bring the space alive with their presence. During the 15th century in Renaissance Italy, mechanical fountains became popular and this continued into the Baroque period when they were highly desirable garden features amongst the grand tourists of the 17th to 19th centuries. At Chatsworth House in Derbyshire, one of the earliest English examples of a Baroque water feature, the hand-carved seahorse fountain, was installed around 1691 and with some restoration over the years, does not fail to impress today. Classical illusions remain popular, as seen in the suggestion of ionic columns supporting the flower basins and pineapple filial of the exotic garden fountain installed at RHS Wisley in 2017. In the neighbouring cottage garden, the dynamic sculpture Diva nods to an Art Deco design as a woman suspended above the circular fountain swan dives into the space. Not only are fountains aesthetically pleasing, attractive to thirsty wildlife and psychologically soothing with the resonant sound of water, but research also suggests that fountains lower surrounding air temperature in the immediate vicinity by up to three degrees, so providing the perfect refreshing location when temperatures soar during heat waves. And in the iciest winters, frozen water becomes nature's sculpture. The famous cherry laurel maze at Glendurgan Garden in Cornwall was planted in 1833 by Alfred and Sarah Fox to keep their 12 children occupied. Located on the side of the valley, Glendurgan means Deep Valley of Otters, the maze is both a source of entertainment to some 85,000 visitors a year and a manicured work of art in its own right. Although it would take a lot of land, effort and time to reproduce this fantastic ornamental feature, it made us reflect on how a winding path down a garden, the course of its route partially obscured by shrubs or trees, can create far more of an intriguing sense of adventure and mystery than a straight one. A giant hand that has plucked a succulent apple, installed in the middle of an orchard, this sculpture cannot help but make you smile. The Mother Orchard contains 120 types of mostly rare and predominantly Cornish and Devonshire apple tree varieties that might otherwise die out, and the sculpture works on other levels too, firstly drawing visitors towards the Victorian cider press in the restored barn, and secondly as a symbol of the orchard having the genetic lineage resting in the hands of those with stewardship of the precious heritage trees. One of my all-time favourite Main Avenue gardens at the Chelsea Flower Show, awarded a modest bronze medal in 2019, was the Savills and David Harbour Garden, designed by Andrew Duff. This was a sustainable space surrounding the beautiful water-reflected sculpture by Harbour within a layered oasis of calming green leaf texture and form. A ripple of bronzed leaves would rise to gently break the surface of the water from time to time. What perfected the sense of recalibrating to nature's pace was this harmonious but delightfully pleasant playful feature. Scaled up sculptures almost invariably have a gently humorous quality to them. These Alice in Wonderland willow toadstool sculptures, created for an autumn festival at Kew Gardens, also have fabulous texture and the natural materials feel harmonious in a garden setting. 
This tree trunk carving of an oversized, friendly looking toad in the woods at Nyman's Garden in West Sussex makes one want to sit, rest a while and contemplate nature. In this way, ornamentation can bring us closer to the natural world and connect us to living things on an intimate level. Whether or not we are lucky enough to encounter a real toad in the garden, the carving puts wildlife to the forefront of the mind. Ornaments can be used to elevate the mood by strengthening our bond with the things we hold dear.